can you also make me a host? Yes, I'm trying to do that. Oh, yeah. Can you also make me a host? Yeah. Yes, I'm trying to do it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get started. Um, Welcome back. Uh, today we'll be um, talking about data, but first we'll probably spend a good part of the lecture wrapping up the perception lecture. Um, so we'll jump back into the perception lecture in a second. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements. Um, first, um, we like looked at the feedback that we got in homework uh, two and given the situation that everything here is online learning and that lots of people were kind of like out of power and we had all of these kind of like messy situations last week, uh, we decided that we should probably take a step back and give you guys a little bit more time to catch up with some of the D3 and JavaScript and web development. Um, and so we'll be pushing back Homer 3 by a week. Um, I'll kind of like um, update this on the schedule um, uh, sometime this week. Uh, but essentially, this is really meant to be time for you to kind of like revisit and, and like make sure that you're up to speed um, on all of these like technical concepts so that we kind of like can keep, keep going forward um, as we were planning to. Um, and uh, I, will, I also want to introduce a new TA, uh, Jeff Kelso. He's been joining our team. Uh, is Jeff around? Do you want to quickly say hi? Hello. Oh, yeah, I am Jeff. Um... <laughs> yeah, so Jeff will be kind of like um, helping us with office hours, so he'll, he's currently still scheduling his office hours, uh, but you will have one more slot available to get help. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, and speaking of office hours, um, we kind of like decided to make two changes. Um, A, uh, we will be extending office hours, or the TAs will, from one and a half to two hours, um, so that we'll have a little bit more time and the second thing is that we will start off like when you like join the officers uh, at the time that they're starting, the first part will be general questions. So like um, you can uh, kind of use that time to ask questions about how to do something. Um, uh, you can ask specific, hey, I have this problem, uh, but you can't share your screen. Um, so like that, that's kind of like meant to be a more efficient way of discussing most important problems. So for example, for homework two, like a question would be like, how do I actually go about implementing this like recursive algorithm for finding, um, for assigning the position and the levels? That's something that we don't have to repeat over and over again in one-on-one -on -one sessions. But we also are aware that you there's sometimes a need for having like people just look at your code and getting one-on-one -on -one, um, debug sessions. Um, and so what we'll do is the officer will start off with general questions and then when there are no more general questions, or um, at least like, or at the hour, like after we've done an hour, we'll move to a one-on-one -on -one, um, mode. And so we'll kind of like also be using the TA queue. Some of you suggested that um, in the uh, in the comments. Um, and so we've been looking into that, um, and we will kind of like try to figure something out that we make this fair and also predictable. It uh, looks like we have a hand up by Garrett with a question. Sure, Garrett, please go ahead. Yeah, so I just a question. So uh, we're pushing homework three back by a week. Does that mean that everything is pushed back by a week? Or um, like, I guess, kind of like when is homework four going to be due? Yeah, uh, all of the homeworks are going to be pushed back by a week. Um, so that's going to like a bigger change I need to make in the calendar. So that's why I haven't done it yet. Um, okay. But um, we will find, have to find some way, like something will have to change, right? Um, so I don't know exactly what that's going to be. Um, maybe we'll do like a, we'll shorten one of the two week homeworks to that are at the end, like homework five or six to a single week, or we'll have less time for the project, but I, I still have to look over the schedule and plan that out. But essentially homework three now is due next Friday, not this Friday, and homework four will be released next Friday, not this Friday. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions about these kind of new things here? Uh, 
Um, the other thing that I would like you to encourage, uh, would like to encourage you is um, forming study groups. Like um, I think it's it's really hard to do this online, but just use Slack to say, hey, like I'm kind of like working on homework so and so at this and that time. Um, is anybody like just want to hang out on Zoom and kind of like do a study group? Um, and just you can use the Slack. You can do private channels on Slack for study groups. Uh, all of this is encouraged, right? Like we want you. The homeworks are really meant like they're not so much for assessment. They are more for you kind of to learn it. And there's like a little bit of a value to it because like, of course you need incentive. Uh, there there's need to be incentives to do it, but we don't really care so much about like homeworks as a, as a measure of assessment here. Um, and so like collaborate, work together, like help, help each other, like figure out how to do it. Of course, like you need to draw a line in kind of like copying code. You can talk about stuff, but you can never copy code from anybody else, but you can like, discuss like here's how I'm trying to do that. Um, what do you think? What's going on here? You can share your screen and so on if you trust the people that they're not going to co copy your code. So all of that is fair game. Uh, it's really about like learning and doing that efficiently. And I know it's tricky to do this, um, especially in like an, in COVID times where we all have to be online. Okay, so if there are no uh, minister of questions, there's one more item that I want to announce. Um, on Thursday, we'll have a lecture on the visualization alphabet. Um, and so this is kind of like, what are the basic marks and channels that we have to encode data? Um, and for that, there's like a mandatory reading, um, the, a paper that I want to discuss in the lecture. And this is kind of going to be our activity uh, next uh, on Thursday. So this is the crowdsourcing graphical perception using a mechanical trick to assess visualization design. So like everybody, please make sure to actually read that paper. Um, and this is also gonna be kind of like in the scope uh, of what I'm gonna be asking on the exam for all the people that are in the 6630 version uh, of this class. Uh, so just make sure to read that. We'll discuss this. Um, I'm kind of like gonna look for somebody to kind of like give a summary and so on. And so just remember uh, to prepare for that. Okay. So with that, let me move to back to the perception lecture. So, well, um, just recall when we talked about perception, we first talked about some basics of the eye, uh, how we perceive information, um, how Lorats and cones work, how we kind of construct vision, uh, that vision is kind of like always um, um, essentially like an ongoing construction project. We're not seeing everything sharp. We are kind of like perceiving this in time slices. We have kind of like fixations and saccades. Um, our priors on how the world is supposed to be are very strong. And we always like perceive things in the context, as you can see here with the Ames room. Then we talked about color, color basics, um, that color isn't the same as wavelength, uh, dimensions of color, um, what like primary colors for like paint mixing, ink mixing, or light mixing, the chromaticity diagram, color gamuts, how like a display can actually um, like show you color. Um, then we talked a little bit about color maps. Um, and then and we talked about color blindness. There's a lot of people who have some kind of color deficiencies. 10% uh, of all males have some red green weaknesses um, and uh, how we can test that. Um, and so on. Uh, and then we talked about that color like is very relative, right? So that we have, like it's always important in the context. So for here, for example, we have this corn sweet illusion where this my block here looks much darker than the one at the bottom, but they're actually the same color. And this is just because like how we assume lightning is happening, how we kind of like, think the shadow here is being created and so on. And this is of course important for data visualizations because if you have something like this heat map here, the two fields with the star here have um, roughly the same color, but one of them looks much, much brighter than the other one. Um, and so now I want to continue with the lecture and perception with two topics. First, I'll talk about pop-up and what it means, and then I'll talk about Gestalt principles. Okay, so pop-out. Uh, pop-out are these kind of like visual properties that are detected by the low-level visual system, and this is very quickly. So. Um, we kind of perceive features that have a pop-out property, property very, very rapidly within 200 and 250 milliseconds. And we are really good at perceiving them. 
this is all processed in parallel. So if we see, like, if we have a feature that is pop out, then we see all of them at the same time. And this happens before focused attention happens. So we don't really have to think about this. And that's why this is sometimes also called pre-attentive properties. Um, this is a term in the vision community, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the cognitive science vision community. This isn't completely, let's say, the state of the art anymore. Um, essentially, the, the, the way to think about this is that there are certain features that are perceived very quickly, then there's other features that are perceived like fast, but not quite as quickly, and we have this continuum. Uh, but for like visualization purposes, it's useful to think about there are some features of like properties, um, like color, for example, um, in a otherwise like gray um, display that simply pops out very quickly, and we can use that in visualization uh, for that. Um, and so what's cool about Popout is that it was independent of the number of distractors. Um, and the opposite of Popout is that if I have to sequential search across features when I have to process them serially. So this sounds maybe a little abstract. Here's a concrete example. On the left, you have one point that is shown in red and it immediately pops out. Like you can all recognize this within like a, um, just a millisecond or a couple of milliseconds essentially. On the right, we don't have that feature. So this difference in hue is a very, very strong uh, pop-out effect. And as you can imagine, this is, doesn't really matter, like what I meant with here, independent of the number of distractors, me recognizing the red point, it doesn't depend on how many blue points are there. So the distractors don't matter for that. Uh, here's another example. Here we have a pop-out for difference in curvature and form. Um, and some of you might have spotted this already, like it's the, uh, or most of you should have spotted this already. We have this pop-out effect here on the right. There is this, uh, this there's uh, one circle in a sea of squares, uh, but it's maybe like you also notice that this isn't quite as fast as hue. Your hue like really stands out. The shape here is a pop-out effect, but it's not quite as strong. And so now um, I'm going to try it. Like, this is, uh, this is a lot of fun in the classroom. Um, it's not so great usually, or I'm assuming online. But uh, if you guys could just unmute yourself um, and just prepare to clap, uh, like physically clap with your hands. Um, I want to hear that. Um, and I would like you to clap as soon as you spot like the feature that is like that has a pop-up. If you spot the odd one, clap, OK? Ready, everybody? Here we go. Okay, I hear some clapping. Great, thank you. We have all your clap. <laughs> then we have the next one here. Okay. Plenty of people immediately saw that. Okay, next one. <laughs> so it takes a little bit longer, but most people were able to recognize it. We have closure here. Next one. Size, great. Curvature. Okay. <laughs> What's the odd one here? That's all red. Red circle. Red circle. Red circle, exactly. But like, it's not quite as like good in as in the classroom. But in the classroom, you kind of like. Every time somebody claps, like this is like very basically for all the other examples, everybody instantly claps. And then here we have more of like an applause. People, it takes a while. Uh, and so this is just an example of um, like this is not a pop out feature. So because red by itself is a pop out feature and the circle by itself is a feature, but the combination of red and circle is not a pop out feature, right? So we actually have to look through all of these uh, symbols and then rationally think about which one is different from them and then we can recognize it so it takes us like half a second to a second instead of a couple of hundreds of milliseconds uh, to do that and so that's not a pop-out feature here this one um, so um, this is called conjunction targets um, they don't have a unique visual property um, because the distractor objects here have both properties so like we, you've, we've seen some of those before, but some of these pre-attentive properties, just to recap, are orientation, length, closure, size, curvature, density. So we see like a denser cluster here on the right, uh, hue, 
color or val color value or brightness um, flicker. The flicker animation here isn't isn't very good. I can I see. And then also motion, direction of motion. So if you have one element that uh, moves in a different direction, that is also very easy to spot. Um, and so like first, like why do we care? Like this, or what are the kinds of tasks that you can do with that? So first you can do target detection. Um, so for example, is there a feature like that present or not? Um, that, that's very easy to do. We can do boundary detection. So for example, if we have like all red features and all blue features, we can very quickly see where the boundary between these groups of the elements is. We can do region tracking. We can track one or more elements with a unique visual feature as they move in time and space. And it's actually also pretty good at counting and estimation. So if, we, if I show you like a number of pop-up features, you have immediately a sense of how many there are. So you can very quickly estimate uh, the number um, of, of features that are present. So here, for like just some examples, number estimation, you already have rough, uh, roughly an idea that this is somewhere between five and 10 features uh, without really thinking about it on the left. Um, and then here on the right for boundary detection with the red blue case, you can like see this boundary very quickly. Um, of course, this does again not work for conjunction features. So here we have a boundary uh, between like, uh, let me see, annotation. We have a boundary right here, oops. That wasn't very good. Boundary right here. So here we have kind of like blue squares and red circles. Here we have blue and red squares. But of course, that is not pre-attentive. Um, this isn't what we um, like. What we mean by pop out. Uh, and there is, as as I already hinted at the beginning, is there is a hierarchy of pre-attentive features. So. Like color hue, as you can see here on the top, is much, much stronger than shape. Um, and if we mix them, so like as you can see here on the right, if we have shapes and colors, like the color really stands out. Um, if we have on the bottom right, if we have kind of like the, uh, the pre-attentive features are shapes, it is like you can perceive it, but it's not quite as strong um, as it is in like the cases on the left. So like, why do we care about this in visualization? Well, it can be used to draw attention to areas of interest. Um, so for example, if you want to, let's say, if you search for something, like if you search for an item, even in, in like, if you search in a PDF or in a browser, uh, what's happening is that um, this is actually color highlighted. And so the browser or your PDF viewer kind of like use a pop-out feature to draw your attention to that area of interest. Um, it can also be used to express similarity or group membership. So if you have two items that are alike for some reason, you can kind of like use the same pop-out variable to encode them. And then you can show that these are similar, they belong to the same group. But of course, to make this work, your features have to be carefully designed. You have to avoid conjunctions. Um, and so that's why, for example, I like when I design visualizations, I usually try to minimize my use of color and reserve color use for these kinds of pop-out features for interaction. So if I wanna, if I want something like to find something or to highlight, to show relationships, uh, I use color because it's a very strong pop-out variable, but it's also tricky to use in another context. So color is really great for doing that, but you have to be very carefully when, uh, careful when you create visualizations so that it actually works. Um, and an example of pop-out are these cues in focus and context techniques. Um, which we'll be talking about when we talk about focus context techniques a little bit later. So okay. we have a couple of questions on, sure. on this. Um, the first question is, if we understand why our bra brains are so quick at picking up this stuff, uh, and if we know that, can we apply it to image processing type of algorithms, or has this already been done? Oh, that's a good question. Um, this is an, an active area of, let's say, vision research. Um, I think there's a couple of, um, uh, I don't know why, uh, this is kind of like an evolutionary question, right? And these are like really hard to answer with certainty. Uh, but you, um, like for example, motion uh, does make sense, right? That something that moves quickly, that our brain is hardwired to uh, really detect that, uh, that makes sense because essentially that's kind of like an evasion technique if a predator or to hunt us, uh, or if we want to hunt something that moves. Um, 
but um, I don't know whether we know about exactly why these other features um, are pop-out properties. We have a very good sense of which features are pop-out properties uh, in which conditions, uh, what are the distractors and so on. That has been measured in detail and detail empirically. Um, and there's, there's plenty of work um, on that. What was, there was a second part to that question. What if we can design vision algorithms? Um, so yeah, vision algorithms definitely are informed by vision sciences. So these feet like, uh, these kinds of features, um, like for example, uh, there is work that measures the visual saliency, saliency of a scene. I've actually, like, I'm going to show something later uh, where we did, where we used the vision algorithm to compute the visual saliency of a visualization. Um, and and that, that kind of like allows us to predict where people are going to look. Um, and uh, that has like multiple benefits. Um, and you can also subtly like uh, change uh, like I say, like you can you can use these pop-out effects in a subtle way. Uh, for example, um, you can compute saliency of a scene, um, and if you want people like in an ad to notice something, you can make that brighter than the rest without it being really strictly noticeable. But people will still look at that thing that you might want them to look at more frequently than not. And so I've actually worked with a couple of people who have done studies like that. So yes, that that all of this information is quite useful. Um, in like computer vision algorithms, especially when you want to predict how humans uh, would interact with something. Cool. And then there's one other question specifically about pop-outs. Marcus yeah. asks, are, are pop-outs the sort of thing that we see on map charts of something like population changes over time? Um, it can be. Um, I like. I would say that uh, depends on how it's designed. Um, I, I would not call something pop-out if it is kind of like the primary visual encoding. Um, so, um, but yeah, so think of pop-out more as something more low level generic that you can use in any kind of context, including on a map, if you want to say show population changes, if you want to highlight like one particular uh, city that has changed the most, you could use pop-out to do that. If you just use color to encode that, um, that 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 wouldn't be pop out right because that's just like encoding something with color okay great so um now moving on to something um a little bit different um when if you remember i showed you this video of this person in the very first lecture um being explained like um explaining to somebody to a stranger um to like to how to find another place on a map, and he didn't actually um, pay attention enough that he would know he was noticing that they're like the the person who was asking for directions actually swapped out, and that's a case of change blindness or let's say um, unawareness, and that's kind of like something that is fairly interesting about the human visual system. So um, change like we can uh, often uh, not remember details of an image across separate scenes, um, except for where we focus specifically. So like if you um, like, if I show you two images um, in in uh, in sequence, you you might not actually remember as much as you think about these Im uh, about these images. And interruptions, for example, if you have to blink or uh, if you have to move your eye, or if I'm actually showing you a blank screen in between two images, this amplifies this effect um, by a lot. And that's not really a failure of the vision system. We actually see all of it. But it's really more of a failure to inappropriate attentional guidance and on how our like memory works of a scene. So let me give you an example. Here, I have two images, and those two images they have like a, quite a like well noticeable difference. Uh, like raise your hand um, if you can see the difference. So I see one raised hand so far. I don't see everybody's I can hear, but basically I see that not a lot of people are noticing it. So pay attention to the shadow of the helicopter in the grass, like here at the bottom. You don't like you didn't actually notice that one image did have a shadow, the other one did not. 
Um, so here's another example. This is like even stronger. Again, raise your hand if you see the difference between the two images. So we see a few people raising their hand. Okay. So now we have a couple of people that have it. Great. So what's happening here is that there's this box. And now if I remove this intermediate stimulus here, you can see that box is actually blinking out at you, right? So this is kind of like even pre-attentive because like it's blinking, it's, like, um, it's moving. Uh, but it was really tricky to see it when we had this, this intermediate um, element. And so you had to kind of like focus your attention on different aspects of the, of the, of the, of the scene. Uh, and then like see that there's actually no change in that particular aspect of the scene uh, to, to be able to recognize that while it's actually changing. Here's another example. Again, raise your hand if you see the difference. And this is functionally very relevant, the piece that is missing in one of the images here. Okay, I see a couple of people now discovering it. So, in one image, the plane doesn't actually have an engine. Um, so it's quite a difference. And again, it's really hard to notice. Um, so wh what's going on here? What are, wh why is this happening? So there's a couple of theories. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail here. This is, again, like deep vision science. It's like overriding or uh, first impressions on the initial views abstracted and so on. Uh, take a look at this if you're interested. What clearly influences whether we perceive something is attention. So if I tell you, hey, pay attention, there's something changing, uh, you're much more likely to, uh, to expect it uh, or much more likely to, uh, to, to see it. Uh, then, of course, the semantic importance of a changed object. So if there's only one person in a picture and that person is, like, is, is disappearing uh, because we are kind of primed to look at people, um, you will immediately notice that. But if there's something in the background, like let's say like a flower that disappears, that's not a most important object in the scene, um, you might be much less likely to see it. Um, and then low level object properties such as like color or texture or anything like that are also overlooked more easily than like presence absence. So here is a gradual example. Um, here I'm running a gradual change. Uh, let me see whether this is actually running. Okay, so now you're seeing a gradual change in the picture. Um, and like the two frames of it are very different, like the beginning and the end. Um, anybody notice what changed? See one hand up, two hands up, few hands up. So what was it? The color of the grass. No. <laughs> It like trimmed on the right. Exactly. Like off. exactly. So let me, like now you saw it probably when I just uh, did this immediately, but let's play the video again and pay attention to the corner here on the right. So it's a mode off, like part of um, that field here. Uh, here's another example of something changing dynamically. So a couple of raised hands. Let me run it again. They're slowly creeping in a rock here at the bottom right. I always like have a hard time seeing that even though I know that what is changing actually. Uh, and then here we have another example with this beautiful scene from the 80s. Um, what's happening here. So I'll run it again and I'll switch back. So you'll, this was kind of like easier to spot now. What's going on is this lady's jacket here is changing color. Um, and it's gradual and so it's really hard for us to notice.
Uh, very related to that change blindness is attention blindness. And so I'll play a couple of videos um, that kind of demonstrate that. This is a movie perception test. Watch this brief silent movie and then I'll ask you some questions about it. You saw a person get up from a desk to answer a phone, right? Did you notice anything change during the video? The video had two different actors wearing different clothing. Watch it again. Most people don't notice the change, a phenomenon known as change blindness. This video is. Uh, so I'm assuming that like a lot of people didn't notice that change until they were explicitly made aware. This is an awareness test. Here's another one. How many passes does the team in white make? No! <laughs> The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? And I think we have a question uh, sure. from Garrett. Garrett, yeah, go ahead. We can't hear you yet. Sorry about that. I was uh, still muted. Um, but basically, uh, so one of the pop outs was movement, but um, there was also a. Um, one of the dynamic changes was also movement. So do you know if there's like a, is there like a threshold limit where people start noticing it or uh, do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, so there's not, not a limit, right? It's gradual. Um, this is a continuum. Like the faster it is, the more immediately you notice it, right? Uh, so if something disappears immediately, you are more likely to notice it if it fades out quickly. Like I'm sure you could run uh, an experiment here um, and study that and you would see like a, I, I'm guessing like some, maybe not linear, but some kind of like roughly linear correlation with speed and how people notice it. So yeah, like speed matters for, for the movement. If something moves very gradual, we don't notice it. Uh, and here's like a, a fun scene um, also about attention. Somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. 
In fact, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So yeah, a very entertaining example of like, if we don't pay attention to it, like we, we really focus on, on, on like semantically meaningful objects, like the people that are speaking and so on. The color of this gentleman's jacket doesn't really matter. And so we don't really like think of it or notice it if something like that changes. And so like, why am I telling you about this? This doesn't seem to be super related to visualization, but if you think a little bit about it, it actually is. Um, so like the take home points here are to find meaning in what we see, we must selectively pay attention to what is important. Um, our low level vision is driven by object features rather than a conscious effort where to look. Um, and our attention is driven by pre-existing knowledge, expectations and gold stored in long-term memory. And so all of this is kind of like uh, important to think about when you're designing visualization that you kind of like know about like what are the expectations, what is the pre-existing knowledge, uh, how do you actually like make something pop out? Um, how do you leverage these low level vision features to like highlight the things that you care about? Um, and, and also like if you want to make a change in a visualization somewhat programmatically, like you need to be careful that it's not subtle, that it's kind of like very explicit. For example, if you were to design like a streaming interface where new data is coming in, that might be something that you really need to think about. Okay, so I want to move on to Gestalt principles. Um, gestalt principles um, are these kind of like um, ideas from psychology uh, from uh, the Vi like Vienna Circle around Wertheimer in 1923. That was kind of like established around then, um, and also recent extension to that. Um, and so, what is what are Gestalt principles about? It's like, these are kind of about patterns that transcend the visual stimuli that produce them. So, for example, here at the bottom, you see a couple of segments of a circle or a couple of segments of um, a rectangle uh, but that they are not actually rectangles or circles you kind of like your mind fills in the gaps here so like the whole um, like what do you perceive is more than what is actually there um, and and there's like this original quote of this is das ganze ist etwas anderes als die summe seiner teile which means the whole is something else than the sum of its parts notice that it's not the whole is greater than the sum of its parts uh, which is kind of like um, the, the latter quote is attributed to Aristoteles and Kafka, like one of those uh, uh, scientists um, back in the 1920s uh, made the argument it's not necessarily greater, but it's just different. Um, and, and well, I, I, I would subscribe to that. Um, and so what are these Gestalt principles? Um, you can think of like, for example, here, by proximity among these elements, we are creating lines and we are grouping them. So we, we kind of like perceive uh, the elements in these rows as belonging together and we do perceive them as, as, as lines. And similarly here, we perceive those here as two different groups uh, because they are grouped spatially. Um, and you can see that like here, we would still perceive these here as groups and we typically wouldn't perceive the orange and the black as groups, um, or at least not as primary groups. If we can explicitly uh, encode it as primary or as groups, then we might we, we might uh, be aware of that. But we proximity is much stronger than uh, than color here. Um, so here is like an animation that you could use for layout. So if you wanna if you wanna make something like uh, th this is like two different uh, approaches how you can play with proximity to group things in different ways. And this is something that is like very important when you like design layouts. Um, and um, you can group like data items by placing entities in close proximity. This is essentially what we do when we do dimensionality reduction algorithms like uh, PCA or, or any MDS or TCNE or anything like that. We are encoding uh, similarity by proximity. Um, we can also um, like uh, use color to do that. So here we are grouping by color hue, um, and it's also very clear uh, um, which elements belong together. Um, and here is like for for a layout, like we have one group versus three groups just by by altering the color. Um, and we can also use this to change a focal point. Like here we are actually changing the size and the 
uh, uh, and the color, but um, like that's just like an example of how you could use this uh, to emphasize something. So um, the idea here is that you can co-modulate a visual channel such as color, shape, size, value, orientation, or texture um, to kind of like show these similarities, or you can also add a glyph like a pointer, a label, a frame, or a background, like in the example on the right. Um, and notice that uh, here we have a, another example of like where pop up works um, for this, this grouping in the, in the left case and where it doesn't because we have just too much color in the scene. So we have to use serial search uh, in, in that case here on the right. Um, this is also slow in a cluttered environment. So like um, basically like here you see that I have highlighted um, uh, a couple of points um, on uh, uh, two browser windows. Um, and you might spot some of them quickly. Like you might, you'll probably spot this here easily and this here easily. Maybe you spotted this one, but this here is fairly small and it's all in a cluttered environment that you might have not seen this one here because it doesn't really um, stand out very well. Um, you, you could also express similarity by simply modulating everything else. So for example, here, uh, I've blurred everything else except the two points that I want to make, or I've darkened everything else if, except for the two points that you want to make. And so the darkening here, for example, has been used uh, by, like, I think in Windows 7, uh, for example, to kind of make, uh, make you focus on the, on, the, on the modal dialogue that is popping up in front of you that was usually used for some security certifications. But people also have studied this for guiding people to the right uh, button in a complicated interface, as you can see here in the middle. And people have used it to highlight items um, in a scatter plot, although um, it is not, not like a really like a great encoding to use blur um, and to make something stand out. Um, especially it's, it's binary, like you can blur something or you can't, but you can't have different grades of blur. Uh, people don't really notice this well. So like you shouldn't use something like this unless the sole objective is to guide attention toward a single set of items. So if you just if you still want to understand the context, uh, then you shouldn't use something like this. So uh, I'm going to do another experiment here. Um, and so think of it like a little bit about what it, how are these two items or these four items grouped right now with proximity, with color, with size, with shape. And it's pretty obvious how they are grouped. Um, like we, we have the bottom two grouped by proximity, the colored ones grouped by color, and so on. But now I'm changing the scene a little bit, and I'm adding these connections to it. And now the, the connections here mentally for us override the grouping, right? The connection tells us it's actually those two things that belong together that are connected even though their position and their color and so on uh, is, is, uh, is uh, different, uh, we perceive those two elements to belong together. And that also works for something like outlines, connected regions, or curves. Um, and so this is a very powerful way to express relatedness, um, and that overrides all of the other grouping principles. Um, so yeah, this is just another like uh, example of um, how like similarity uh, versus connection versus enclosure can be used uh, um, to to show these relationships to to highlight these elements. Um, and we use this also for um, uh, the connectedness here. In the case on the left, you have uh, basically a dot plot or scatter plots to show something like a time series. On the right, we've actually made this into a line chart, and now we understand much better which elements belong together. And then we are also using this enclosure on the, the dotted line here at the top to like highlight this inversion uh, in this particular scene. Um, we can use common region like just to group um, elements that otherwise look scattered and that don't have uh, something in common in other, in other ways. And so this has been research um, and in visualization tools. Um, here are a couple of, of um, visualization techniques that have been developed to show set relationships. So for example, think of the green things are all the restaurants um, in this particular city here. Like you 
can use a contour to connect them. You can use like a polyline or a branching line to connect them and, and see these relationships. Um, another Gestalt principle is continuity. Um, what is happening here, at least what we perceive it to happen is that there is a square in front of a circle. But uh, so we assume that the circle here continues behind the square, but we don't actually know it could be that the square is actually just like a part of a pie chart, or it could be that this, the circle isn't actually a circle, but it is like one of those two shapes here on the right. Um, but we still like we perceive good continuity, and we assume that the circle just continues the way it is in the visible part. So don't like we would never expect this to look like that under the circle. Um, so for example, uh, we have. We, we can easily spot continuity in, in an example like this because these, uh, these elements line up and create these nice uh, curved and straight lines here. So we, we tend to, like for example, in this scene up here, like we always tend this to be perceived, this is one curve and then there's another object. We don't think of this as like uh, a curve like this and then the object like this. Um, and similarly, for, for, for data visualization purposes, it's kind of like easier to trace like something like this uh, than it is some discontinuous um, node link layout here uh, on the right. Um, we can work with closure, which is another Gestalt principle, to kind of like make something appear similar to what the, the perceptual hysteresis examples that I showed earlier uh, in, the, in, in the first lecture or in the second lecture. Um, so, for example, here the, the panda, it's actually not like completely explicit, right? We can fill in the gaps about the panda, about the shoe, and about these different faces here. And we can like even like very little information is sufficient for us to infer shapes here. So we infer like a shape and this more generic uh, shape here on the right, like a rectangle and a, a more generic rectangle on the right by really just the hints of the you know, like how these um, uh, segments in the circles are angled. Um, we also like uh, enjoy things that are symmetric. We assume that things are symmetric. So, for example, um, in the in the case uh, on, with the with the cross here at, at the top, we always would assume that it is actually a cross and not the shape we see at the bottom. Um, and if we have something that is symmetric, we assume that it it is a figure. Um, it's kind of like harder to like. Uh, See something as, as standing out as a figure if it's not symmetric. And we, we are good at spotting symmetry. So for example, here we see like this is a buff population pyramid. Um, and we can clearly see um, where there are any differences between like and usually these population pyramid have men on the left and women on the right. Um, and we can see like very easily where there are any differences. And so you can see that like there are differences uh, here like people age, women usually live longer than men. So you can see an asymmetry here. Um, and you can see some uh, like um, asymmetries uh, around here as well. This is probably because of a war. Okay. Much better. Yeah. Sorry, I kind of dropped out of the slide. Oh, here we are. Um, and sometimes we can like it's not completely clear what is the figure in the ground. These are like uh, MC Escher drawings that play with that. So you can see the, either see like a, um, a cup or two faces in the left one, and then you see this transition between birds and fish um, in the right one. Um, so he's kind of like playing very cleverly with figuring ground uh, in these examples here. So um, here is like an, an illustration for that. Like if you uh, like how you can like use that, for example, in a layout on a website. So what are the applications of this in visualization? I'm going to show this one example. This is work that I did uh, back in 2011. So I showed this highlight example earlier. Um, and now I'm blurring everything else. And you can see that there is some elements that are popping out. You might see the fishing in the general, but you might not see some of the other ones. Um, I can use the um, kind of like the darkening everything else. And this is like also fairly easy to spot for the elements that you care about. Um, then I can use color um, to do that. 
or I could use blinking, which is maybe slightly annoying, but we can like very clearly see those elements. Um, and then I could use connectedness. And, and this is kind of like actually like it's very easy to spot all of the elements that belong uh, that I've that, that I tried to highlight here. So for example, I, I often have a hard time when I search something in a PDF, the highlight is sometimes way too subtle. And I would I would I would wish they would have something like that built into PDF viewers. Um, but what's the problem here? Like the highlighting um, kind of occludes some of the information. Um, and so you see that the, uh, this is overlaying some of the text. And we kind of developed a technique that was actually using this visual saliency information um, and like use the computer vision algorithm to predict the saliency and then find an optimal route that minimally distorted uh, like what was uh, in the scene, what was important in the scene. And so we use, we use that to kind of like um, connect these items without occluding relevant information in the scene and that algorithm would find those routes dynamically. And so that was really a fun project. We also used like, this is called context preserving links. And we also used an eye tracking experiment to evaluate all of this. So what are the takeaways um, about the whole perception piece here is like knowing about perception is important for visualization and UI design. Like how do you choose your colors? How do you show relationships? How do you draw attention? How do you minimize the risk of overlooking something are all like questions that that you can answer by kind of like thinking about human perception and understanding what's going on in human perception. Okay, so I kind of wanted to do like an introduction to data today too. We don't have a ton of time, but I'm going to start it anyways. Um, I do want to like spend some time on an activity that I've planned. Um, so uh, we're a little bit behind, but um, I'll just Keep going for now. We talked about this. Um, so this is now kind of like a, now going away from psychology and, and uh, moving now in data and measurement theory more or less. Um, like in what what are the things that we care about when we talk about data? So first we have a couple of terms. We have data set types, things that can be visualized, and data types. These are like the fundamental units. Uh, combinations of data types make up the data set types. And so data set types are like tables, like structured ones are tables, networks, fields, and geometry. And data types are things like items, attributes, links, positions, and grids. And so we'll go through those um, in like the next couple of minutes, and then I'll continue uh, on Thursday. Um, one important thing is um, data can be structured or unstructured. Uh, and in, in data visualization, we mostly care about structured data. So we have like known data types and known semantics. So this is all of these like tables, networks, fields, and geometry are all structured data types. But like in, in, in speaking in total volume, um, most data is actually unstructured or loosely structured. So we don't have a predefined data model that would be, for example, data that is text heavy interspersed with facts such as dates or times or locations. Video is usually unstructured. Images are unstructured. Um, and like a big part of computer science is actually translating unstructured data into structured data. A natural language process processing, text mining, uh, or like a lot of computer vision is about extracting structure from unstructured information, object recognition, tracking, and so on. Uh, but data visualization usually assumes some kind of structure or like, or use the structure that is derived from unstructured data using NLP, text mining, object recognition, or tracking methods or anything like that. So when we visualize data, we usually work with structured data. Here's a very simple example of how I could extract structure from uh, an unstructured data set. So this here is uh, uh, um, based on uh, the Bible, the King James Bible. And the structure here was derived by a simple pattern search, x beget y. So for those who are not like native speakers, beget is an old word um, that basically means who, who, who is the uh, x is the father of y or the, the uh, parent of y. Um, and if you do that, you can kind of like extract these, this, this network information. So here you can see that you have um, Abraham. Uh, beget Isaac, beget Jacob, beget Judas and Pharaohs and, and so on. So you 
create this network of elements. And then this here is also scaled by how frequently are these, uh, these actors mentioned and how frequently are these relationships mentioned. It's a very, very simple uh, way to extract information, to make uh, structured information out of unstructured information, but still pretty useful. We can like understand relationships um, of characters in the Bible, basically without ever, ever having to read text. Um, and here's another example of that. Um, here is the patterns X is Y in 18th and 19th century novels. Um, and you can take a look at, uh, you have these interesting relationships. So the banker's wife or the ambassador's wife or the uh, father's wife. But if you have like different relationships, a freebooter, he doesn't uh, frequently have a wife, but he has a bride or the sailor has a bride or the outlaw as a bride or the bandit. And so we see these relationships, those two terms or these pairs of terms are used together and less frequently with the other, even though they're semantically very related. And we should be starting our design uh, yeah. really soon here. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's actually a good point for me to stop. Um, I wanna move on to um, an exercise today. Um, a critique of a tool, a visualization technique that's called code swarm. Um, and um, I'll, um, Devin, can you post the link to the chat on our Slack while I do play that video here that introduces the tool? Hi, I'm Michael Ogawa, creator of Code Swarm. This video is meant to be a companion to our paper, so it assumes some basic knowledge about our visualization technique. Due to the size limitation on videos, we cannot cover everything we wanted to. For the full story, please visit the CodeSwarm website to see the original videos. The story of Python begins with Guido Van Rossum, working alone in the late 1980s. He is Python's creator and benevolent dictator for life. A year later, Two developers join him, but they stay on the periphery of the swarm. One of them, Jack Jansen, created MacPython. His activity stands out because his sphere of influence periodically converges and diverges with Guido's. Another person, Fred Drake, appears and commits mostly blue document files. Indeed, he will become the lead documenter of Python. This pattern of Guido being the clear central developer with specialists on the periphery continues. In the year 2000, the popularity of Python takes off. We see many new developers coming in as the project activity increases dramatically. And for the rest of the video, the project stays busy. The Eclipse project is vastly different than Python. Right away, there is a flurry of activity. Many developers working on many files at nearly a constant pace. This is possible because these people were already working on the same project before Eclipse was open sourced. We also see that even amid the chaos, the Eclipse project is made of many components. There are many developers clustering around the center, yet they each have their own set of files. In other words, there is not one large set of files being worked on by everybody, but many small sets of files being worked on by individuals. This can be attributed to Eclipse's rich client platform, which facilitates modular design. Looking at the commit histogram, we see something not apparent in the Python video, weekends and holidays. Weekends are the periodic gaps in the histogram occurring every seven days. The holidays can be seen at the end of December throughout the video. These breaks for- Okay, so uh, I don't need to play the rest of the video. Um, in, the, in the instructions, you have um, a link to a couple of other videos and um, I'll now start breakout rooms. Um, and I'd like you to kind of like discuss in your breakout groups, uh, like what about what's going on with the visualization? What is the data that is encoded? Uh, what are the different meanings? Um, 
and also do some like kind of qualitative judgments. And then um, I'll bring everybody back with like five to 10 minutes to spare. And then we can discuss this um, in a group. Okay, now let me set up the breakout rooms and like stop my share. Okay, so I'll see you all in 10 minutes.
Okay, we should have everybody back. Yeah, great. So, so what did you think? Like, first, let's start a little bit off. Like, um, what is the data that is represented in, the, in this visualization? We think it's the number of files they're working on, the number of people working on each individual file, and then the time course as to when they're working on those. Exactly. So we have people, we have files, uh, we have time when they're working on it. Um, anything else? Uh, the type of file that they're working on, uh, documentation okay. versus code. Yeah. How can you tell? Is that color? Yeah. Blue and red. Blue was documentation. Yep. Oh. Exactly. Uh, anything else? Uh, how much? how much they're working on them right like it would glow in bigger uh volumes or i guess or bigger areas for how much that was work was actually being put into them like the scripts um would often glow really bright red at certain points yeah exactly so we have this activity information like not like what are the files that are very currently being worked on or being committed to um there's one other important piece Maybe also structural yes. information versus we have one um, big code base versus multiple areas of the code base. Yeah, that's a very good point. We have kind of like this um, structural information that emerges from the whole picture here. I guess like also, go ahead. the distance there from like other people when they're working on it, sort of like who's working on similar things almost. Exactly. So who's working on similar things, but also who's working on which file, right? So um, that is like, how is that encoded? Like who is working on which file? We discussed that quite a bit in ours because there are too many files that you can't have them all overlap. So if the dot is next to two names, then you say that the two people are working on that same file. But if there are like 40 people, and six files, it's gonna be all over the place and you can't possibly encode them all together, can you? Exactly, yeah, so that, that is a tricky bit. So um, I guess that the follow-up question to that would be, is that visualization able to encode like precise data? No. No, yes. No. And so do you think that somebody like, a, let's say a product manager of the Eclipse project would use this visualization to evaluate the performance of their developers? No, no way. So, so what, what, what else is the, the audience or the purpose of a visualization like that? Yeah, it, it feels a lot like it's for PR almost. Like, especially the video game one would be like for the users of the video game uh, to see like how development's going in a really non-specific way. I feel like it shows like how chaotic it is. Like I just felt real, a lot of chaos watching the, the visualization. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? It was very pretty. <laughs> it was very pretty. I guess that uh, that kind of like um, speaks a little bit to the intended audience, right? So it's it's not it's not like hard data visualization for decision making. Um, it's probably a little bit more for kind of like reflecting. Um, you can do some discovery, um, especially if you look at multiple different projects like that. But I'm assuming, or like, who do you think is like most interested in watching this? CEO says, so are you advertising well? <laughs> yes. Even the developers themselves. I think. Exactly. Developers themselves might actually uh, like watching that, right? Because they kind of see something they, they think about, they know about the project and may, might see the patterns. Um, hey, I'm working mostly on these documentation files or you can see like, my, my set of files. Um, and so I think that is a big, big kind of like um, part why this visualization was quite, let's say popular in the open source community for a while. Um, so go ahead. Uh, the background sound and the voice is the main thing which is more engaging. <laughs> well, that's a particular video, yes. I do like that, uh, that sound. I think that you can also, 
but you need to narrate it if you want to have it work that well. Yes, I appreciate um, the narration. Say that again, David. I really appreciate the narration. It makes it a lot easier than reading ahead of time what the colors are, what the timeline is, what each circle represents, things like that. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess we've gone um, through most of this. I guess um, what we haven't talked about much is um, the histograms, um, like at the bottom that we saw in the video. It's actually not shown in the screenshot that I have in the design critique file. Uh, but what are, what's the purpose of these histograms? Those well, the histograms number. show us the number of files or programs being created at a certain time. Exactly. So they're kind of like your activity, like heat map on GitHub, right? Um, they, um, they, they, key, they, they show like how frequently uh, it, or like how much is being worked on, on overall in the project over time. Um, and so this, this kind of like sub niche of visualization is, is called often organic visualization. Um, kind of like the idea of, of this, there's a couple of uh, techniques like that that are like really like meant more for like enjoyment and casual uh, casual reading of what's going on in data. And they're not meant to be like precise, right? And they, they're called organic because you have, they have this kind of like natural imprecise feel. Anybody have an idea of how, how would you implement something like this? Something that uh, covers a little bit different information that I thought might be interesting is like some sort of a cumulative uh, measurement, right? Like you're just basically measuring those commits on the bottom to see like at the end who has contributed the most files. Yeah. That would be an interesting extension. But I meant more, more like uh, technically, like to, to implement what you see here with those rings um, and, and like and these multiple people working on the same files and all of them kind of like, anybody have an idea of how you would implement that? We'll be covering that. So what, what we'll do, what, what, what's happening here, I, get, I haven't looked at the source code, but very likely this is some kind of like force directed, um, um, heuristic algorithm um, so that you have like um, some center of gravity, like the, the person that is working on. And if, if, if a file is worked on by multiple people at the same time, they're kind of dragged to a place between the two of them. And there is some repulsive force. So there's kind of like a, a physics simulation very likely happening behind the scenes here um, to, to kind of like make something like that appear. So any opinions? Did you like that visualization or dislike it? I thought it was really good. <laughs> Maybe too much, but it was good. I thought it was too busy. But too it's busy. Right. Yeah. I hear too busy and then. Uh, too Anna. busy, yeah. I liked it for what I was doing. I liked it. It was, uh, it was pretty pleasing. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's kind of like interesting because it's not your standard visualization, right? It's kind of like something very creative, something like novel and engaging. Um, of course, it's like it, it is really more entertaining and less, let's say, utilitarian, uh, but uh, still um, like an interesting project. Okay, uh, any other questions? Anything about procedure? How to like if you want us to use this as one of your activities? Do you, everybody know how to do that? So we we've gotten a few questions on this, so it might be good to quickly recap how this works, sort okay. of in general. So just like. Um, when you want to use this as one of your activities, just like write up a page of what were the main arguments being discussed, like a page, but I mean, not a page print, but you can like a, a paragraph in brand, like a couple of hundred words. Um, what are the, like answer those questions in here, uh, but be, be, be brief um, and, and just make like, uh, just show that you've been here, that you've participated. That's really what this is about and that you thought it was about this problem. And through the semester, we will grade five of these, and exactly. there will be there will be more than five opportunities, and you should submit it within twenty four hours. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's the idea. Like okay. this is meant to be like participation and not like an assignment that you do offline. So if you've been here, just like take now 15 minutes, 10 minutes, uh, write this up, submit it, and then you're done. Do you need to redesign? No, there's no redesign in this one. This is just a critique. Uh, no, you don't need to write up who was in your breakout group. This is individual. Okay. 15 minutes, that's my kind of assignment. <laughs>